So welcome to uh, this presentation. So today I'm going to talk about uh, SPIN, high performance streaming processing in the network, or I would say uh, beyond RDMA. So what are we going to do after RDMA comes? But let me first give you a little bit of a background um, on the, the history of high performance uh, networking interfaces. So history actually goes back quite a while. So it's nearly 40 years uh, when um, the first Ethernet device has been developed and it was uh, used, uh, the programming interface for this was uh, sockets and the protocol as we are still using today is the internet protocol, the TCP IP protocol. In high performance computing that was relatively quickly recognized that this protocol TCP IP together with sockets is not the most efficient thing you can do for communication, not the most efficient communication mechanism. And then the idea was to implement a coherent memory access over a large scale device so called uh, the scalable coherent interface, uh, short SCI, that was itself uh, relatively quickly replaced, or not replaced, but maybe superseded by a mechanism called fast messages, which is then the first 3D messaging based mechanism, um, also based on active messages in fact, to have a very high performance communication interface. Then um, this was quickly taken up by Miranet in the implementation, two implementations, GM, Glenn's messages, and MX, Miranet Express. Um, that was the first to, or one of the first to um, commercialize OS bypass devices, which was now a big breakthrough in the sense that you could now have complete user level communication to a different machine. And that was actually in the in, in mid 90s. So that's uh, quite of an old concept. And then uh, uh, quickly after that, the Quadrix uh, interface was enabling protocol offload to the device. So they had the first programmable device in a very limited uh, context, but that was the, one of the devices you could actually offload code to. And that also was followed up by the virtual interface architecture, which then uh, first introduced the concept of zero copy. So the idea is now that um, even though you had OS bypass in this case, but you didn't necessarily have zero copy. So you may have had staging buffers while the via interface really came with this idea to have a complete global virtual address uh, addressing mode where you can copy right from the user level buffer into the destination user level buffer uh, without any additional copies. Of course, I mean, zero copy really means one copy because I always have to copy once from the <laughs> source to the destination, but there are no additional copies. Um, then Cray Gemini took this up and that was now a proprietary interface by Cray that really used a very similar uh, mechanism, very similar theory to make this happen. And then as we all know, this the most um, well-known interface is the InfiniBand interface, uh, which bases on the virtual interface architecture um, mostly, but introduces a new mechanism that is then uh, called RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access, which arguably has had the most impact on the um, data center and beyond HPC community of any of those uh, technologies. And then InfiniBand continued into the uh, OFAT interface, the Open Fabrics Enterprise Edition uh, run by the Open Fabrics Alliance, just as a standardization mechanism for InfiniBand itself to move it into the future. And then um, another innovation in this field was the Portals 4 interface, which was first to enable triggered communication operations. So somehow simple state machines that you could use in order to automatically trigger new messages based on, uh, on NIC state. So NIC as the network interface card. And this was then mostly taken up into a library that is probably the most uh, modern communication interface uh, called LibFabric that was uh, driven by Intel at that time. But let me focus a little bit on RDMA because as I mentioned, that is really the most um, impactful um, um, communication innovation of the last uh, couple of years that made it way beyond um, uh, supercomputing. So, for example, uh, this was actually adopted in the context of Ethernet even. So this is a uh, rocky RDMA over converged Ethernet. So the idea was so powerful that many data center um, vendors and operators um, or uh, not data center vendors, but, but vendors of data center networking equipment um, wanted to have the similar concept of this remote direct memory access, which is clearly tied to this virtual interface architecture in the data center, right? So however, the data center interconnect of choice is usually RDMA, uh, it's usually ethernet, which has to be routable. So there's Rocky version one and Rocky version two. I don't want to get more into details, but what I can say is that uh, most of the Microsoft um, Azure cloud nodes, at least the newer ones, are RDMA enabled. And this is a big move because as you may know, Microsoft is, or the Azure cloud, is one of the largest, if not the largest by today, um, cloud provider on the planet. So it, it's, it's right up uh, with Amazon, at least in the Western world. And the idea is to, um, that if they move to RDMA, that is going to be a big impact. So furthermore, there's this RDMA over Ethernet. And in the um, supercomputing area, as we all know, most of the interfaces are in fact RDMA since quite a while. 
So let us look a little bit more into uh, how this RDMA works, in fact. Right? So here I have on the left side uh, a network, and the remainder of the picture is actually just the compute node. So the compute node has a CPU complex, has a memory complex, and has an RDMA networking card. So how does this now work when messages from the network come into the RDMA system? Well, they are obviously arrive. They arrive through a transceiver. They're uh, serialized at the transceiver. Um, and then they move on the RDMA NIC. Each single packet moves into a, an RDMA processing unit, which does all of the uh, management of RDMA traffic in the sense that it first checks if you have the right uh, if the, the packet coming in has the right access. It translates user to physical address and does all kinds of additional uh, management um, things for every single packet. Then it instructs the DMA unit to transport that packet into the correct input buffer because after all it's called remote direct memory access. So the remote comes, the packet has direct memory access to the input buffer at the, uh, in the DRAM. In, in fact, the virtual address space of a particular process at the, destination uh, at the destination node. So what happens then is that of course this packet needs to be processed. And how is it processed? Well, it's read from the input buffer through the whole memory hierarchy of our uh, uh, today's CPUs um, into some register and then processed in the register by the ALUs of the, that are not shown here, but basically up here, the ALUs of the CPU to um, do whatever processing the packet does. But of course, uh, every packet has to be processed because otherwise we wouldn't be receiving a packet. <laughs> so why would we just uh, store it? So let's look at the numbers a little bit. And you've seen some of the numbers here that I didn't talk about, but let's look at them more in detail. If we have a Mellanox card today, that's an InfiniBand card, Connect X5, I can buy today. It's not even uh, too expensive. It runs about 500 to $700, depending on where you uh, buy it. But this card delivers one packet every five nanoseconds. Right? If you look at the future of networking te technology, for example, 400G technology that's right around the corner, if you believe some Ethernet vendors, you will have one packet every 1.2 nanoseconds flowing into your card. But now, if you look at the CPU complex and all the latencies involved, um, so we need uh, 250 nanoseconds to go through PCI Express, we need at least 40 nanoseconds to go from uh, DRAM to the chip, and then even on the chip, the latencies are kind of high. Of course, this is a rate, and these are latencies, so obviously this, there, there is, a, is a mismatch, and we are comparing side of kind of apples and oranges, but still, if you look at these very high um, latencies in the system, packets will actually spend quite a while to go through that overall system. And you can clearly see that the system is not optimized for very high performance, very high throughput packet processing, because otherwise it wouldn't have the deep memory hierarchy. But there is one piece of our, uh, of our device, of our computer, that is optimized for high uh, throughput packet processing, and that is our RDMA NIC, because after all, that device today processes one packet every five nanoseconds, and tomorrow will process one packet every 1.2 nanoseconds, otherwise the device is not working. Right? So what if we could take this device and extend it to very high performance streaming processing of these packets, of these incoming, uh, lots of these incoming packets, instead of processing them on the CPU, okay? So let me now um, phrase this in a slightly different mode. Is the different mode, I would say, is that we could see this overall idea that I'm going to present as a way to accelerate the network, accelerate packets in the network. And what we know about acceleration is actually we have applied acceleration for at least the last decade to compute acceleration. So for example, we have GPUs, we are looking at FPGAs, we are looking at different devices like tensor processing units to optimize the uh, particular calculations. But now let's think about, can we optimize this for networking traffic or for network cards or for computations that would be ideally performed in the network? But let me first talk a little bit about what are the principles of acceleration in the compute area? Because we do this, we're doing this since 10 years, which really means that we have lots of experience in there. So the major principle of acceleration for compute is specialization. So we specialize our compute units to a particular function that uh, whatever we choose, it could be a broader function, like for example, GPUs, which are good at, at many um, different throughput-based computations, or tensor processing units, which are really only good for matrix multiplication um, that even has a specific shape and specific precision. Furthermore, compute acceleration has to be easy to use, right? Otherwise, nobody will use it. But the definition of easy is, of course, uh, can be stretched in, in several directions. It has to be somehow programmable, has to be portable across devices, it has to be efficient, it has to support libraries just for basic software engineering techniques. And of course, all of these uh, three models that I'm uh, putting here, OpenCL, CUDA, and OpenMP, enable all of these 
um, to certain extents. Right? And the idea is now that I'm going to present is, well, let us think about an acceleration for the network. Something that the next technology that really has to come after RDMA, because RDMA was an acceleration for the network, but now RDMA is only transporting your data. That's all it can do. It's really only direct memory access from a remote node. But what we want to do is we want to have fully programmable acceleration of networking traffic in the network card. So in this very highly specialized device. So first of all, if you're trying to implement or, or introduce a new programming model or a new model to do um, computation, you need an abstract machine. An abstract machine that is somewhat enables the programmer to relate to the target architecture. So a NIC has an abstract machine model. And in fact, our spin NIC will have a very, very similar abstract machine model that is just extended to be fully programmable. So first of all, a NIC, any NIC today, has fast shared memory that is typically called the packet input buffer, where you deposit all the packets for processing later, um, for moving them into, into um, the CPU, for example, or sorry, the DRAM. Then the NIC has a packet scheduler where arriving packets are scheduled to the input buffer. Furthermore, what we propose for uh, the, the spin NIC is that this NIC has multiple cores that we call handler processing units here, HPU 0 to uh, 3, so 4 in this case. And of course, a network card has to have a DMA unit in order to communicate with the main memory at the CPU through read and write uh, transactions that are moved back and forth between the CPU. Oh, uh, sorry, to the main memory, not the CPU. The CPU in our abstract machine model for spin has actually a very limited role. So it's not performing any packet processing as it does today in RDMA systems. Remember, today if you want to process any packet, you have to involve the CPU. Here in this model, the idea is that the CPU just simply uploads handlers to the fast shared memory that are then processed at the HPU. So it's still a von Neumann architecture where I'm uploading a small code, really like a GPU kernel, to a specific device that is then executed for incoming packets. Furthermore, the, um, the memory management of the network card on the side is fully performed on, uh, by the CPU. So it's really kind of a remote controlled accelerator like we have today in GPUs and many of the FPGAs um, that we talk about. So how does this now work in practice? Well, we have packets arriving to this fast shared memory that are scheduled by the packet scheduler. And then these packets are scheduled to the different HPUs for packet processing. And then the HPUs themselves, they execute some code in the von Neumann style. And this is then um, instructing the DMA unit, for example, after the packets have been processed, to deposit them into main memory. And then the CPU can do whatever it wants with them. But the CPU may not even be necessary in this mode, as we will see for some of the applications that I will talk about in a couple of minutes. So let me now give you a little bit more of a motivation of how that model works in practice. So if you look at the very simple ping pong example, let's, if you look at networking, that's your hello world of networking, ping pong. Right? You send a message from a source node called the initiator to a destination node called the target. Here in this case, I want to differentiate a little bit more that the source node, in fact, has a CPU and the main memory, that is one piece. And the source node also has a networking card that is another piece of the source node. The same at the target. So we have network card and the main memory. So if you talk about RDMA, here. How do we perform a ping pong? Well, the uh, source CPU initiates a ping pong message, which then the networking card DMAs from main memory of the source CPU. Then the networking card sends that message to the destination network card. The destination network card, in turn, DMAs that data into the target memory. Right? And then on the way back, it does exactly the same thing. Right? So there's nothing, uh, nothing surprising here. Um, but now the question is, how do we do this in spin? And as you may guess, we now have a programmable NIC. So it's still somewhat the same. So the message originates in the main memory of a CPU, of course, is dma by the initiator. But then it arrives at the target. But instead of being deposited into main memory, it is replied to right by the target, because the target has the opportunity to, to react to this incoming message. And then it's, of course, deposited back into main memory at the source. So this, you can see there's a significant saving in latency already because we, we save this round trip time to um, the main memory on the target. But this is not too um, astonishing in this case. But what is actually um, somewhat more astonishing and somewhat less easy to understand is what happens if we have larger messages. So for example, we want to send a gigabyte of data in this ping pong. So here, um, it's much less than a gigabyte because only three packets, but uh, let's bear with me for the um, animation. So the idea is that packet by packet, we are streaming in the RDMA case the message into the destination memory. So once the message arrived at the destination memory, the pong is initiated and the streaming is done on the way back. 
So what the now, and now you can kind of imagine when I'm already talking about streaming, what I mean by really a streaming processing in the network. The S stands for streaming. This is one of the major um, innovations in this uh, programming model as opposed to other network offloading models. The idea here is now that in the spin model, we of course do never have enough memory to store the whole message at the NIC, right? because it may be a gigabyte message. But the idea is that packet by packet, we forward the data through the network, pinging it back to the destination. And this is really one of the key insights that you can do it packet by packet and that you can do it in a very modular way in this way. This is why it's called streaming processing in the network. But now let's go a little bit more into detail of what the programming interface actually looks like. So every single <coughs> message in a network consists of multiple packets. So we have a header packet, a payload, or a set of payload packets, and a last packet that is called the tail. Furthermore, we have our packet scheduler that we've met before in the uh, uh, um, system architecture. And then if you look at the header packet, the header packet is processed by a specific header handler, which is in this case the ping pong handler. So this means the packet is matched against a certain um, a, a table, and in this table is determined that I want to invoke this small C code on the packet, and of course it gets the right um, arguments here. Furthermore, each payload handler is now in parallel, potentially in parallel, processed by a payload handler, and each completion handler, which is only one per message, is then invoked once all the payload handlers have been completed. So this is the overall programming model. Now the question is, how do I now associate a particular, um, a particular set of handlers, a header handler, payload handler, and completion handler, to a connection? Well, that's relatively simple, because the usual connect call that you would invoke for any establishment of um, a connection, like a TCP IP connection, you have accept and listen and whatnot, um, in InfiniBand, you have a connect-like call. The idea is for this call, you would just specify these three different handlers, which would enable you to specify different handlers for different connections. So this is quite of a powerful model in, in, this, uh, in this setting. So furthermore, SPIN, as, uh, as we want to propose, is really not a particular implementation but it's more like a programming framework. It's more like a, a view, an abstract, um, abstract device architecture, an abstract machine model, which is an abstraction very similar to CUDA or OpenCL or, or OFAT in, in Portals 4. And the idea is really that um, it enables many different device implementations. So like CUDA enables many different GPU types. OpenCL even claims to enable FPGA implementations. Um, SPIN shall enable a vast flurry of different um, network card implementations. However, the main goal of this interface is to never obstruct line rate. So if you're uh, in networking, this is the holy grail. Oh, this is not, it's not the holy grail, but it's, it's really the most important feature to protect this line rate. So in the sense that if you, do, if you develop a NIC that cannot achieve line rate for small packets, then you have lost. Right? But as we just uh, learned, the line rate is problematic because at 400 G, that's going to be a, nearly a billion messages per second coming in. So I need to be able to process a billion messages per second. How do I do this? Well, this is actually interesting because what we use First of all, the programmer must limit the processing time per packet. So we cannot spend arbitrary amounts of time per packet. But even if we spend quite some time per packet, of course, it's going to take longer than 1.2 nanoseconds right, to process a packet. But then we can just do a very simple calculation based on Little's law. We are assuming we have 500 instructions per handler at the 2.5 gigahertz CPU. So that's fast for a NIC, I understand. But even then, we would only need 25 kilobyte of memory in the NIC itself, in registers, so very fast memory. Furthermore, what we're assuming in the in the specification, we're assuming very fast shared memory, we're assuming a very quick invocation for each um, packet handler because well, every 1.2 nanoseconds a new packet is coming in, so you can't take more than that to invoke the function of that packet. So that's a relatively um, complex invocation mechanism, but that is all possible in practice and I can talk more about this uh, if needed. But the major message is that all of this can in fact be implemented, as we strongly believe so, in modern, most modern RDMA NICs with a firmware upgrade, or at least in software programmable smart NICs, like we have multiple different uh, vendors offering us, like the, the Mellanox uh, FPGA NIC, um, the Microsoft FPGA NIC, which are both uh, RDMA NICs, um, and the Broadcom NIC, which is also an RDMA NIC that, is, uh, that has uh, various ARM cores in the, on the SOC. So, first of all, I want to um, now give you some results that we have achieved. And as I mentioned, SPIN is not a particular implementation of a model. 
So what we decided to do is we decided to implement a simulation environment which enables the scientific um, understanding of various parameters. So the simulation environment makes it very simple to change parameters, for example, change latency, change bandwidth, change processing power in the NIC to play with different device configurations. In order to achieve this, we combine the LogOpsim benchmark, uh, sorry, LogOpsim simulator together with the GEM5 simulator. So LogOpsim is a network simulator which simulates um, how messages or packets flow through networks. And GEM5, as you probably know, is the cycle accurate uh, CPU simulator. You can see all the parameters here. I don't want to spend uh, too much time on how we actually set up the experiment, but it is em emulating some kind of ARM system for HPUs, um, eight ARM cores, I think. Is it eight? Yeah, it should be eight. Um, together with an InfiniBand style uh, NIC that has been scaled up to 400 gigabit per second to look at the future um, architectures. So if you look at this, um, here is the, the data size and the round trip time. This is the very simple ping pong benchmark result. I showed you the schematic earlier. This is just uh, the performance now. So we have about less than a nano, uh, sorry, less than a microsecond um, time to transfer the message and a relatively high bandwidth, which we basically achieve the 400 gigabyte per second. If we do the same uh, implementation with spin, we get a slightly better uh, latency and we get a slightly higher bandwidth for exactly the reasons that I told you earlier with the streaming mode and, and uh, the saving of the depositing into main memory. But of course, um, ping pong is not the example that anybody wants to uh, really use in practice. So this is why we have three use cases that I want to quickly present to you how spin is used, uh, can be used in practice. So one is the network group, group, group communication case. Another one is for distributed data management, really from a database um, kind of context. And another one is, again, in the high performance computing context where we transform the data layout as the data moves uh, through the network. So let me start with the first one, which is uh, probably also what you're most familiar with, um, the broadcast. So broadcast is a primitive in the MPI specification. It's a group communication operation. It's a very simple operation. The idea is we have a piece of data that we want to distribute as fast as possible to all other nodes. As we can see here, we have eight nodes, one node one, node two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each of these nodes has again, CPU and memory and a NIC, right? So that you can read this. And then there's one data item here. And how do we actually implement broadcast today? Typically as a tree. So what happens? We send a message to the neighboring node. And then these two nodes both forward the message to two other nodes. And then these four nodes who now have the message forward the message to all other nodes, right? This is a very simple binary broadcast tree. Nothing surprising. Performance in RDMA is that in our simulation model. Here is the number of processes and we have the latency in microseconds for an eight byte, very small message, okay? So how does this now work in a Portals 4 or Connect X4 um, environment where the NIC itself performs these broadcast operations, but the NIC is programmable in a limited, or to a limited extent. Right? So the message still originates at the CPU. The message, message is forwarded through the network to the destination NIC, who in turn deposits it into main memory because the NIC has no buffer, has no state in these models, right? in all these NIC uh, collective acceleration models. And then the message is again forwarded from main memory now, not by the CPU like in the RDMA case, but directly by the NIC and deposited into the other uh, NIC's memory. And here, of course, we continue like this. So we see that the CPU plays no role here, but the message is still written and read, written to and read from the DMA, uh, sorry, the, yeah, by DMA into the DRAM memory of the target device, which gives us a little bit of speed up because we still need to cross the PCI Express bus if the NIC is in, in a PCI Express attached NIC. But now if you look at the spin model, which you by now know is working differently because it's doing a streaming forwarding without ever depositing the message into main memory. So it's really just keeping things on the NIC on a packet by packet basis. And we can see that what's happening now is that the message remains on the NIC and the NIC forwards the message without the message ever hitting main memory. Okay? So then you can now guess that this gives us a, a significant speed up because we do not need to go into main memory, which is one of the major costs in these computing systems, especially if you're using PCI Express with a 250 nanosecond latency in between. And what we can also see is that these handlers, in order to perform this, they're relatively cheap. Right? So there's only a couple of, of tens of instructions to perform this in practice. Okay, so now I want to go quickly through the second use case, which is a rate acceleration use case for distributed fault-tolerant database systems. 
So the idea here is that I want to store data into an in-memory database, but I want to store it in a way that even if a node fails, I can later recover that data. For this, I'm not using simple replication as is typically used in the systems community, but we want to save memory, so we use minimum distance separable uh, rate codes for this. In this case, it's, a, it's just a standard um, parity code. Where the idea is you, you commit a message to the server, or you com commit data to the server, and the server itself has to update a parity node. But of course, before the server updates a parity node, it needs to apply computation to figure out the parity data. Right? So in the RDMA system, and again here, CPU, memory, and NIC. In the RDMA system, we have an incoming write. The uh, write is then, of course, processed by the CPU because the CPU needs to um, compute the parity data. And then the CPU itself initiates via RDMA the parity update to the parity node, where the CPU again applies the data to the local um, in-memory database. And then, of course, there's an ACK mechanism that tells the server node, hey, I'm done. And then the server node itself tells the client, I'm done. Okay? Now, as you can uh, see, this is the latency and, and bandwidth here. So we have about a three microsecond latency and a reasonably high um, bandwidth. And in the spin case, all the processing can be performed on the NIC, which by itself, fetch, uh, by itself fetches the data from the DRAM and uh, performs all the processing. By the way, this processing is a very simple processing. It's basically applying an XOR function to the data in the easiest case. Um, then the parity update itself is sent right to the target node, which then also in turn updates the uh, parity data on the target node directly. And then the ACK is again just sent uh, via the uh, NIC at the server node back to the requester. And you can achieve a substantially higher um, bandwidth and a substantially lower latency. Right? But as you see, it's always the same model. It's a relatively simple mechanism to offload data processing to the network card where you do less transport of the data, less back and forth between various memory systems. The last use case is the MPI data type acceleration use case, where the idea is really that you would process the data. I mean, the, in the original case, you, you get a message from a source CPU, which is again DMA'd into some kind of input buffer at the destination node. But then the problem is the data is in the wrong layout. and needs to be processed again. So it needs to be read from the destination DRAM into the CPU, where it's split into the right data layout, like for example, a transpose data layout or a strided data layout, and be written back into destination memory at the uh, target node. So you get this performance. Here it's slightly different this time. So we here have the completion time in microseconds as, as before, but now we vary the, stride, the block size, the block size and the stride size at the same time. And uh, this, is, this is giving us uh, a, a certain bandwidth here. So in the spin case, what we do, is, as you can imagine now, the processing happens in the NIC, right? And the data is deposited right into the destination main memory without CPU involvement or anything else, any additional data movements. You can already see that I'm moving the data only half the time, because in the first case, it went in here, went out of here, and into the destination memory. So I'm saving about 50% of the data movement overhead. And you can actually see that it's nearly a 4x speed up, because you save this at, at various instances, because you need to read and write. And of course, DRAM as a synchronous interface is either reading or writing for you, right? So this is why you get nearly a 4x speed up. Of course, there's some, some loss on the side in, in terms of bandwidth in this case. So there are many, many, many other use cases for the spin model that you can imagine. So for example, we looked at um, traditional MPI rendezvous protocol implementations get significant speed offs of about 50% on average um, for the communication phase. We looked at a distributed key value store. We can do all the key value store processing right on the NIC uh, implementing SPIN. Um, we looked at conditional reads, another database use case where you really want to filter at the source node where I'm requesting data. Um, furthermore, we looked at distributed transactions where you can implement large scale distributed transactional systems. We looked at fault tolerant broadcast where the NIC itself duplicates um, broadcast messages, so you could implement um, all kinds of fault-tolerant mechanisms for uh, large-scale coordination. And the last case, of course, large-scale coordination in the data center context, you can implement distributed consensus protocols fully on the network device. So this is something that ex allows you to accelerate all kinds of um, use cases, but then there's even the larger set of use cases, just if you think about different graph implementations. Very irregular data science um, computations that could maybe fully performed on the NIC for certain very simple patterns. So with that, I would like to uh, finish my presentation and give you the opportunity to ask some questions. I want to note that um, 
The full paper is, uh, can be found on archive. The, the version in the SC proceedings is very suboptimal due to a, a page limit that was imposed upon us uh, after the submission. And um, we also want to point out that you can reproduce all of our results by going to this web page and find um, the full simulation model, the full implementation, and everything else on the SPIN model. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions.